Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, our annual Walter Roberts Lecture. Um, my name is Sean Ade. I'm the uh, director of the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication here at George Washington University. Uh, IPDGC is a uh, co-branded effort with the Elliott School of International Affairs and the College of Arts and Sciences, specifically the School of Media and Public Affairs. Um, and we're very proud to be able to host this event. Uh, this is our fifth iteration of the Roberts Lecture. Um, the Roberts Lecture is co-sponsored by IPDGC and the Walter Roberts Endowment Fund, uh, the chair of which is uh, Barry Fulton, who's in the front row over here. Um, and the Walter Roberts Lecture is named for uh, the person who really founded uh, this institute, uh, Walter Roberts. Walter, as many of you know, uh, was one of the original broadcasters for Voice of America and uh, had a long, illustrious career uh, in public diplomacy at U.S. Information Agency and elsewhere, and also near and dear to our heart here at GW, Walter taught what we believe to be the first class on public diplomacy right here at the Elliott School back, I believe, in the late 1980s, um, and has always been a champion or was always a champion for uh, not only public diplomacy, but specifically teaching and research in the area of public diplomacy. Um, we're very happy to have his son, Bill, uh, and his daughter-in-law, Patricia, here with us. Um, and this lecture uh, is something that we established uh, several years ago, and we've had quite an array of speakers. We've had uh, Brent Scowcroft, Tara Sonnenschein, uh, Robert Ford, Thomas Pickering, and of course tonight's uh, distinguished speaker, David Ensor. Uh, as many of you know, David Ensor is, uh, has been, uh, of course, an award-winning journalist for uh, I think more than 30 years. Uh, he was also um, the Director for Communications and Public Diplomacy of the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. Uh, he was, of course, the Director of Voice of America, uh, and he is currently the Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council. And David's going to come up and give a few introductory remarks about some things uh, that he's been thinking about. He just finished a stint at the Shorenstein Center, wrote a very uh, interesting and provocative piece uh, that you can find online that I highly recommend for those of you who haven't already uh, read it. And then he will be joined in conversation with our own Frank Cessna, who is the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs. Many of you know him from his long career as an award-winning journalist at CNN and other places. Some of you may not be aware, however, that, Frank, I believe your career began at Voice of America? Yes. Uh, journalistic career began, yes, not his barista career, his journalistic career began at uh, Voice of America. So this is a subject uh, near and dear uh, to his heart. Uh, Frank is a, is a great champion of IPDGC, uh, has done a lot for us uh, over the years, and does a lot with uh, something that he calls Planet Forward, which is a really exciting initiative uh, at GW that looks at sustainability issues, uh, among other things. Um, so we, without further ado, we have a great evening uh, tonight. We're going to have plenty of time for, for questions from you, the audience, uh, later. And without uh, any more of my wasting of time, I'd like to introduce David Ensor. Thanks very much, Sean. It's, uh, it's great to be here, uh, to see many friends in the audience, and I hope uh, people who will become friends uh, here as well. Uh, and uh, it's an honor to have been asked to give the Walter Roberts lecture here at, uh, at George Washington University. Walter was, as you said, an extraordinary person. His was one of the first voices that uh, was heard on the air in 1942 when Voice of America first went on, uh, speaking in German. Uh, Seventy years later, at a celebration of VOA's anniversary, I asked Walter what were the most memorable stories that he recalled covering. Uh, he did not hesitate. The most important, he said, was the liberation of Stalingrad in 1943, because it was the first major defeat suffered by Nazi Germany. And the hardest story for him to tell, the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I know Walter would be pleased to see you all here tonight for a discussion about an aspect of American foreign policy that he strongly believed needs to be a higher priority. So do I. I speak, uh, as mentioned, from the perspective of someone who was the 28th director of the Voice of America for four years after 16 months working in uh, public diplomacy efforts at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan, and having been a broadcast journalist for 30 years before that. But just this uh, month, I started a new job at the Atlantic Council, which uh, 
I would describe as a forward-thinking, forward-leaning think tank that develops policy ideas. Really lively place. I'm, I'm still drinking from a fire hose over there. Um, we live in a world where Vladimir Putin himself admits that he, quote, weaponizes information. It's also a world where terrorists use head-chopping violence porn and slickly produce jihadist propaganda to recruit terrorists from our own midst on the internet. How should we respond? What should we do in the information space? It's clear, and not only from our recent history uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, that America cannot prevail uh, with hard power alone. But I believe the nation's capacity to participate meaningfully uh, in the global contest of ideas has been allowed to decline in recent years, uh, even as the information challenges we face grow and change. The United States has no one in overall charge of its information efforts. It's often cut the budget for public diplomacy and also for spending in real terms on international broadcasting. Back in 1999, the U.S. Information Agency was disbanded as a peace dividend at the end of the Cold War. Public diplomacy efforts were moved to the State Department. International broadcasting was put under a bipartisan board. In the 17 years since then, public diplomacy has frankly suffered from rather anemic budgets, in my view, and often from excessive leadership turnover. Public diplomacy has frankly not always been valued at the State Department as highly as conventional diplomacy, and I believe in the digital age that way of thinking is out of date. In recent months, both President Obama and presidential candidate Hillary Clinton have called for American digital technology companies to help the government prevent terrorists from using social media and internet to propagandize and recruit. And there's also the ongoing public debate, uh, the post-Edward Snowden debate, about encryption tools. What's the proper place uh, on for our country on the scale between, on the one side, security, and on the other side, privacy. Should Apple help the FBI to get into the iPhone of the San Bernardino attackers or not? I mean, these are big, complicated topics and not my subject today, but their complexity, I think, underscores the nation's need for full-time, sustained, high-level leadership on information policy. <clears throat> There's a counter-messaging aspect of this, too. I'm just going to get water because, frankly, I think I need it and I don't want, to, want you to suffer. Um, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> um, there's a counter-messaging aspect of this, too. The uh, State Department has a $5.8 million effort to counter ISIS recruiting online. Um, this is critically important work. But uh, the effort, in my view, is much too small. Uh, so I've actually come to the view that it may be just as well that in the upcoming defense authorization uh, budget, the Pentagon is given permission to launch a bigger effort of its own. After all, they have the money. Uh, maintaining civilian control, however, and high-level coordination over such efforts uh, will be key, as will strong partnerships with allies in the region. And I frankly think that the actual efforts of that sort uh, on, in website chat rooms and on social media should be done by Arab partners in the region, not here in Washington. But those efforts should be robust. In fact, I'm not squeamish here. I, uh, our executive branch should be working to aggressively shut down sites, interfere with hate speech, and make it so that ISIS web recruiters find when they reach out to a kid in Los Angeles or Minneapolis or anywhere else in the world, there is usually an American-funded Arabic-speaking counter-messenger in that same chat room or on that same Facebook page uh, 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 responding and counter-attacking against their efforts. And of course, there's much more to public diplomacy than countering ISIS on the Internet. One of the most effective U.S. efforts in Afghanistan has been to strengthen the independent media there. While serving as a diplomat in Kabul, I was proud to help fledgling Afghan news organizations to get onto their feet. And it was also exciting to bring the first broadcasts of Sesame Street to the Afghan people uh, and to know that so many children and, frankly, also parents would be learning to read with the help of Big Bird. And so American soft power is, is obviously created by many more actors than the government. It's helped or at least shaped by everything from Hollywood to Harvard from George Washington University to Google to Apple to Facebook to Caterpillar 
the Mayo Clinic, rock and roll, a lot of things that attract people to America. The global perception of American life and values is probably more shaped by Hollywood movies and TV shows than anything else. Um, someone that some people in the room know well, a, a scholar named Martha Bayless, has recently written about this in a book. Uh, she titled, Through a Screen Darkly, Popular Culture, Public Diplomacy, and America's Image Abroad. In her view, the increasingly violent and sexual content of Hollywood is reducing America's ability to influence others. But there are still movies being made, like Spotlight or The Martian, for example, two that I liked, um, and that I think help America's image. So the U.S. should perhaps seek ways to broaden international audiences for such films. But I can't think of a better way for our country to project American values and help our friends around the world than by, by exporting our most fundamental value, freedom of speech. Because the U.S. is one of the relatively few nations where there is no state broadcaster on the air, here, Few Americans realize that the Voice of America is actually among the world's most influential media organizations. In November, the VOA's parent agency, the Broadcasting Board of Governors, issued its annual report on global audiences, and that showed that in the last four years, VOA's audience has grown 40 percent to almost 188 million people worldwide each week. They listen, watch, or read VOA on everything from shortwave radio to satellite TV, from smartphone apps uh, to Facebook, Twitter, and the Chinese microblogging site Weibo. This growth came despite budget cuts uh, in real terms and despite basic problems, in my view, with the governance structure over VOA and its sister entities. I mean, the idea behind the creation of the bipartisan BBG, the Broadcasting Board of Governors, is, is, is laudable. And, it, and, and, and there was a need to put something there in place when USIA was abolished. Um, the BBG was designed to create a firewall protecting the independence of the journalism of VOA and its sister entities from interference by policymakers. But I, I've come to the conclusion that it, it's, it's just incredibly difficult, and understandably so, for nine busy people to successfully run a large, complex collection of media companies as a part-time activity. The BBG has had difficulty sometimes playing an, an effective executive decision-making role. It's not helped that the White House and the Senate have often left seats unfilled for long periods. My criticism of the BBG is certainly not about the individuals serving on it. There are distinguished Americans on the BBG now and have been in the past. The current board understands well the structural problem and is addressing it. They rightly want to get out of the business of running U.S. international broadcasting month to month and have appointed a full-time executive officer, which I think is a very good first step, uh, because what's really needed is a full-time professional boss. But uh, the man who's been appointed, uh, John Lansing, a seasoned media manager, uh, in my view also needs legislation now giving him clear authority over all budgets and personnel, which he does not clearly have at the moment. Unfortunately, there's a bill currently before the House of Representatives, which unless amended could actually make things worse. The current draft of H.R. 2323 would create yet another board and yet another CEO to oversee three of VOA's sister entities, Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, and the Middle East Broadcasting Network. So now there would be two separate and competing U.S. civilian international broadcasting efforts. There would be needless duplication of oversight and management layers. There would, it would also exacerbate an already, I think, unhealthy rivalry over market roles and money between the Radio Freeze and the Voice of America. Furthermore, the bill has language in it ordering VOA, which has always been a full-service news broadcaster, to only cover news relating to the U.S. or U.S. policies. In my view, that would be a poison pill, a recipe for declining audiences and declining impact worldwide. Instead of confrontation and divorce, what we need is a model of collaboration between VOA and its sister organizations. We need more projects like the Russian-language TV show Nestayashevremia, or Current Time, 
uh, which was created after the seizure of Crimea by the Russians, uh, with anchors in Washington and in Prague. It's co-produced by RFE and VOA, and it's seen on 25 stations in nine countries, and then beyond that, about two million people within the Russian Federation uh, tune into it every week uh, on their computers. So it has reach into the Russia, even though Putin is trying to keep programs like Nestayashi Vremia out. And the point of this, the point is this, neither RFE nor VOA could have done this quality of program alone. Let me turn now to what I think is a key question, which is really, what should VOA and its sister entities be? In a crowded digital media space where broadcasters like RT peddle half-truths and disinformation, is journalism done with the old-fashioned goals of objectivity and balance still the answer? Or is it time to simply advocate for government policies, to spin, as many of the newer state broadcasters are already doing? In other words, should VOA be turned into a full-throated advocate for American policy rather than a journalistic enterprise? I spent last semester, uh, at the end of last year, up until Christmas, at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, as was mentioned. And I, I looked for my project, my research project, at the, uh, the two main models that are in the marketplace today, comparing VOA and the BBC World Service on the one side, and Deutsche Welle and one or two others, with newer channels that advocate for their governments. I looked at some data on Russia's RT, on China's CCTV, and at the coverage by Al Jazeera Arabic of the events in places like Egypt. It was, I can tell you, it was an interesting exercise. While influence is a very difficult thing to quantify, you can rest assured that without measurable audience, you won't have it. RT's, Russia's RT, for example, claims a worldwide reach of 700 million people. That claim is deliberately misleading. The Russians use potential audience reach as their metric. In other words, every single person who might conceivably see their programming because it's coming down from a satellite that's going overhead, or because it's on a cable menu with perhaps hundreds of stations, that is available to them in their home. No one uses that metric. It is meaningless. Uh, professional broadcasters measure actual audience. The VOA audience estimate of 188 million is based on careful polling by the Gallup organization and others, as is the BBC World Service estimate that it has a worldwide audience of 300 million people a week. After the shooting down of a Malaysian air jet over Ukraine, the world's media reported on the mounting evidence that the weapon used was Russian-made and could have been fired from a town held by Russian-backed rebels. Perhaps you all remember that time. For almost every news cycle in those early days, RT offered some new theory on who could have been responsible for almost uh, well, uh, as I say, al almost every news cycle there was something new. Were the Ukrainians trying to shoot down Putin's plane? Was it all a CIA conspiracy? If you watched RT, there was a new one every three or four hours. If the goal was confusion, RT may have been partially successful, but if the goal was credibility, not so much. RT has not put out detailed, backed-up audience estimates. Uh, but there are some numbers available if you search and if you have a good Harvard graduate student looking for you. Um, in the UK, for example, in May of 2013, when the Ukraine story broke, RT was 175th out of 278 channels in the United Kingdom. As RT's coverage became increasingly shrill and one-sided, that number dropped to 90,000 one year later, less than two-tenths of one percent of the UK viewing population. Another example, China's CCTV with a budget in the multiple billions of dollars, has poured money into broadcasting in Africa. Yet, the results also appear to have been relatively disappointing thus far. For example, data gathered for the BBG from Kenya in 2013 showed that just 2% of the television audience were watching CCTV. Many, many more were watching the BBC, CNN, and local Kenyan broadcasters. One more example. In Egypt, when Al Jazeera Arabic moved to heavily biased content in favor of the Muslim Brotherhood, 
it lost a substantial share of its audience there in Egypt, much of it to some new Egyptian stations, admittedly, that were just starting up, but much of it also to BBC Arabic. So looking after, at, after looking at these numbers uh, up there in Cambridge, I'm, I'm now even, even more convinced that if the goal is to seek to influence publics in strategic places around the world, then honesty on the air, honesty on the air, is not only the right thing to do, it's also the best business strategy. Now, of course, that does mean telling the truth, even about ourselves. When Edward Snowden revealed details about the surveillance capabilities of the NSA to eavesdrop on communications worldwide, we all remember many in Europe were outraged. VOA covered the story thoroughly. And when there were uh, weeks of protests in Ferguson, Missouri, and elsewhere against police killings of young African Americans, VOA was there, covering it in multiple languages for the global audience. VOA's coverage of these and other stories amounted to an ongoing civics lesson. This is how a democracy confronts its challenges. Openly, it was not flattering. It was sometimes embarrassing. But it was more powerful, in my view, than any propaganda could ever be. For that matter, when Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke to a joint session of Congress denouncing the nuclear deal with Iran made by President Obama's team, VOA broadcast it live with Farsi translation to Iran, where an enormous audience watches VOA television each week, something like almost a quarter of the country watches at least one VOA television show per week. An amount of, uh, that's a number I would just like to le let, think, let you think about that. The amount of impact that Voice of America has in Iran is quite large. If VOA had been a propaganda station for the administration of the day, I think we can all rest assured Netanyahu would not have made air. And I think it was a good thing he, that he did. Again, it was a way of showing the Iranian people how a serious country debates serious issues, and that uh, we listen to everybody. We're open. So summing up, I strongly believe in the impact of honest journalism and the contrast it offers with propagandists out there. As Secretary of State John Kerry said recently when he was uh, uh, at an, an event where they were opening the new Washington Post building here in town, he said, quote, a country without a free and independent press has nothing to brag about, nothing to teach, and no way to fulfill its potential, unquote. And I think back to 1961. President John F. Kennedy recruited the famed journalist Edward R. Murrow in that year to advise him on information policy and to run USIA. In my view, the next president should consider hiring an, admission, uh, an information advisor with a similar heavyweight background. In this digital age, it's time to put information strategy higher on our list of foreign policy priorities. And it's time to confront authoritarian propaganda, terrorist lies, and ignorance head on. Thank you. Well, David, thank you very much. And thank you, Sean. And thanks, everybody, for being here. It's a great privilege to have you, and it's a great pleasure to hear you lay out a case um, as succinctly and clearly as you have. Thank you. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more then, uh, to start with, about why you think, as you said at the outset of your remarks, we have, in effect, disinvested in this very important enterprise, public diplomacy. Well, it's broader than that, I think, Frank. I, I mean, uh, Washingtonians, uh, there's a problem, is there not? <laughs> uh, the, the government is not functioning very well right now. And actually, the, the institution that's in the most difficulty, I would say, is the legislature. It's not passing budgets. It's not passing laws. It's not working very well. Um, so this is, I, I'm afraid, that um, this is one of the areas where we're not getting the country's business done in the way it should be in my view. So there's the larger piece. I think the other thing is that um, there's an assumption. There's a, first of all, there's a, people don't understand what 
Voice of America is or what these broadcasters are. And, and I'm not saying that's the only. I tried to talk about other areas. I mean, it's, if you will, the white programs. There should be gray and black programs, too. Um, but all of this has not gotten enough attention, I think, partly because we have a tendency to assume that everything will be handled just fine by the private sector. You know? And we have this rollicking Silicon Valley ex extraordinary changes in the way human beings communicate led by Americans and American companies. And one has a sense of, well, we sort of, we've got that, that's handled. But it isn't. <laughs> uh, people sometimes used to say to me in, uh, in VOA, what's the po point of a VOA when there's a CNN, right, where you and I used to work? But CNN doesn't broadcast in Hausa or Farsi. And uh, CNN broadcasts where there's, a, where there's a, an audience that they can make a pretty decent income out of. Um, the US has an interest in talking to the people of northern Nigeria and of Iran um, and providing them with, uh, with honest information that they won't otherwise get. That's a national interest. And we, it's a huge national interest, which I think the country should be uh, investing more money and time and effort into. And it should be worked on at a higher level. So how do you get that to happen? I'm sure that you made the rounds on the Hill in your four years as VOA director, and you made this very cogent case. You know what you're talking about. You've been to all these places, and you heard the argument in return, right? So how do you yeah. cut through at a time when the country, frankly, is disengaging from the world in some disturbing ways? Yeah. Well, I think we have to just keep speaking for soft power. I mean, Bob Gates, Secretary of Defense, was one of the biggest fans of increasing the State Department budget, and, and he was willing to give up some of the Defense Department budget to get it. He understood the power of conventional diplomacy, and, and you know, I'm arguing we should also understand the power of public diplomacy. Should we reconstitute a USIA then? Maybe. Maybe. Would that make a difference? I think it would. How would that but be? But I'm not, I'm not sure that necessarily has to be what we do. Um, I think there should be a high level, grown up person who reports to the president, talks to the president frequently on this kind of subject, someone who's respected and, and serious in the White House. I think there also should be, as far as the broadcasting is concerned, a C an empowered CEO, a professional, full time. And uh, John Lansing's a great person. I'd like to see him be that person. But Congress needs to give him more power than he has right now. Well, I'm nominating you for the White House job, <laughs> um, whoever the president is. What's the pay? No, uh, what's the prospect is, is the other question. You yeah. see this, I mean, should this be part of a national security apparatus? Should this be separate from yeah. that? How would you, I mean, I mean, if you actually imagine this yeah. happening and having some impact, how would you see that playing into the structure there? I'd like to see this person I'm trying to create sitting in on cabinet meetings and uh, serving on a senior level in, in the NSC staff and seeing the president every uh, month or so, or writing as Edward R. Murrow did. It's fascinating to read some of these things that he wrote to Kennedy. Um, he wrote one, very blunt one, and said, you know, you, you kept me out in the front of the Bay of Pigs and now look what you've got. Wouldn't it have helped a little if I'd known what you were gonna, going into there? We could at least have planned for the various contingencies. This is not new this tension. No, it's not. And the idea, in fact, when I was at The Voice of America, which is more years ago than I'd like to <laughs> count, um, but Alan remembers, right? We were there together. Uh, but the, the tension was there then, too. You know, yeah. commentary and telling the government story and the government policy versus the straight news. And that's always been a tension there. Sure. To what extent does the, do you think the country need to tell and explain its policies and spin? Because in a world of spin, you have to counterspin, don't you? Yeah. To counter this growing international trend. Well, I'm, you know, when I was in Kabul, I ran a, you know, sizable, robust, and well-funded public diplomacy effort there. And I very, and yeah, I spun for my country, and I'm proud of it, you know. Uh, I argued for American policies. I, I argued for American leadership. I tried to help the Afghan government, because that's who we were there to try and help. Uh, it win uh, hearts and minds in their own country, uh, help them, to help them build the, the perception and the reality that things were getting better, that there was hope for the younger generation so they shouldn't leave. You know, we did a lot of things. Um, I very strongly believe in public diplomacy and, and in advocating for your country, and it's the role of the State Department in the foreign policy area to do that. And I'd like to see them further empowered. Um, but then there's the gray and the black. I, I, we should be bringing down websites and just fierce and, and red-toothed about it when it comes to ISIS recruiting. I, I don't care how many dirty tricks are used to stop people from being killed by ISIS right. in that regard, and that kind of thing. But that's different and separate from, from broadcasting, which
which I believe we've got, we've, got the, we've got it basically right after making some mistakes in our history. We have the VOA charter, which says to the broadcasters, tell the truth. But how do, okay, that's fine. But when the VOA charter was written, when the VOA was established, it was shortwave, this was a Cold War world, sure. there, there was no, God forbid, there was no internet, there was no social media, there was no CNN, there was none of this. How do you think the VOA and other international broadcasting must change to accommodate this very changed world? Or shouldn't it at all? Well, what I tried to do while there, and what I hope my successor will also work on, is just to be as, ad, as on top as possible of the changes in the way human beings are communicating. Absolutely um, platform agnostic. I mean, if, there, if there's a new device invented and they're starting to buy them in the market you want to, you've got to be on that thing right now, you know. And so ready to try anything to reach audiences and going where the audience is. And I always like to use a surfing metaphor. You've got to kind of ride the wave. You don't want to get too far ahead of it either. People would say, oh, do everything digital. Well, in some markets, they hardly have any digital. And TV is great and radio is even quite good, you know. Or in North Korea. I mean, shortwave radio is kind of great in North Korea. It's about all there is. So, you know, it, it, you've got to be agnostic with the platforms. Use whichever one works. Be adventurous. Be creative about the way you use them. I mean, these, the digital media now, we can engage with audiences. It's fantastic. We get information from them. We have a conversation, conversation. with them. It completely changes the nature of, of what VOA and what the other organizations can do in some very exciting ways. However, journalism has to be done by the old-fashioned values where we have the goals of objectivity, balance, fairness. And, if, and my feeling is if you don't have those goals, you aren't doing journalism anymore, people can smell the difference. And, and audiences, you know, the reason VOA has such a big audience and it, the reason it grew 40% of the last uh, four years is because we had credibility with those audiences. They thought we were worth listening to. We had something to say. You know, uh, Radio Moscow had the most powerful sh uh, radio signals on Earth for most of the Cold War, but almost nobody listened. They had nothing to say that wasn't predictable and, what, and often wasn't untrue. So that's the part of your, of your speech that um, gives me the most encouragement, warms my heart, <laughs> is to hear that the ratings of CCTV and RT and not that Al Jazeera great. are not that great and maybe even at decline when they are less credible. Could you tell us a little bit more about some of that research that you were doing and what else you found, if anything, conclusions you drew, because that actually is... is well, they're not putting out... CCTV and RT are not putting out real numbers, you know. So you get them occasionally in little places like the UK, which, you know, very strenuously collects, you know, whether they like it or not. How much have they cut into VOA? How much have they cut yeah. into VOA? Have they cut into VOA? Who, who do you mean by they? CCTV, these other international broadcasters that have come to the marketplace. Well, I mean, look, they have... I mean, CCTV has a multi-billion dollar budget. They can hire some of the best television producers, people you and I used to work with, and I envy them having them, you know. Uh, they can create compelling, visually compelling programming, and they will. In the long term, watch the Chinese, watch that space. They're, they're going to make something out of this. Um, RT, I honestly think the goal is more to confuse people than to inform them. It's to... It's, to create, you know, as I said about the, uh, about the air jet that was thrown down, they had a new theory every four hours. You know, they were just trying to throw dust in the air, basically. And if that was their strategy, it worked. But it's not a strategy for long-term um, impact, credibility, uh, being a respected voice. Forget it. They're not even slightly respected, even in their own, you know, uh, sphere. Um, the only place where that kind of stuff really works is in a country which is closed off from other voices. And unfortunately, Russia is pretty largely closed off from other voices. Increasingly so. It's really very disturbing. You talked about excessive leadership turnover. Yes. In, Too many undersecretaries of public diplomacy. Uh, what do you do about that? That's a question for the president and for the secretary of state. To do they value the position enough? No. So that they don't. Let's be honest. It's a very important job. It should be more, it should, be, it should have a larger budget than it does. The budget is, is not as much as it was under USIA, you know, and, and that's bad. I mean, as in real dollars I'm talking about. I'm Dan, you're turning away. I'm not sure whether that's right. I can see him turning away. Is that right? In real dollars, okay, um, which is, I think, the only thing that matters. 
Um, so I, I think that public diplomacy should be properly funded, properly led, which means let your undersecretary stay for a while and uh, pick people that you're really going to listen to and have them in your inner circle and, you know, take it seriously. So who, in your experience while you were on the inside, while you were VOA director, who got it? Who, did anybody lobby for this, whether on the Hill or in the administration? Or is this just some kind of backwater and we've got to make a lot more noise to bring this to people's attention? Well, I don't want to say nobody got it, and I don't want to sort of trash anybody or, uh, or, p or pick out any heroes because I don't think there are any especially great heroes. The, f the fact is, you know, the government is, there's something new every day, right? And especially lately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so well-meaning government officials serving at various levels do the best they can with the situation they've got. But it, it isn't often that people stand back, have time to stand back, frankly, and say, wait a minute, have we got the structure right? Have we got the funding right in a big sense? And it's very much the responsibility of Congress to get engaged and do that. And I think they've been failing in this, spectacularly failing in it for years. They have been. Yes, they have. Um, you also talked about the State Department's $5.8 million. Mm -hmm. um, was that right? 5.8? Yeah. Yeah. And now the Pentagon may be part of this. The Pentagon's coming in with a much bigger budget, and it's in the, and, it's and, in the defense authorization and, bill. How is that going to work? What is that all about? Why do we have competing power centers to do this job? Well, look, I, I mean, frankly, I, I, it really ought to be a State Department-led effort. But the State Department doesn't have the money. 5.8 is not, I mean, it should be 508 or 5.8 billion or something for that kind of for that kind of a, that level of importance compared to you know some of the other things we do, but the reality is they don't have the budget. If and, they had, the and, and there are our troops' lives can be at risk, and whether in Iraq or elsewhere, if this isn't done properly. So it does matter to the Pentagon. It is a it is a matter of defense. Let's say for a moment that the resources were there. Yeah. What would you do with them? How would we? effectively counter this? Well, for example, if we're taking the Middle East, uh, I mean, I would have a very robust program. I mean, as I say, seriously, well-funded and well-organized. I would have the counter-effort online, if you will, done by um, friends of ours in, in the Arab world. By the, and this is something that Undersecretary Stengel and others have, have been working to achieve. There's a center now in the UAE, I believe, and there, there are others that are going to be worked up. This is the right way to do it. Um, it shouldn't be done from Washington, but it should be done on a scale. Yeah. That means that you almost, if you're a ISIS recruiter sitting in Raqqa, you almost can't get on without somebody tracking you and finding you and following you and arguing against you and tearing you off the air. You know, it should be quite red-toothed, is what I'm saying. <laughs> and this is not this is not about journalism. This is about um, uh, national security. And it's, about, it's something the executive branch should have properly funded and do well. And then on the other side, I would suggest in broadcasting terms, for example, my esteemed friends at the M Middle East Broadcasting Network, which is our sister network that does the Arabic broadcasting, um, you know, there's some very fine journalism done on MBN. It doesn't reach a very large audience, frankly. They've got a model, which I understand why, but, but which is basically to have, um, to be a, a network, you know, a constant, constantly on a channel amongst the many channels you can get from your satellite dish if you're, if you're watching in Arabic. The problem is that, that that market is completely saturated, whether it's Al Jazeera or Al, Al Arabiya or, you know, you name it. So uh, Al Hura, which is the MBN network, gets a pretty small slice, frankly. They are late latecomers. Uh, they're seen as a government voice. It's, I personally would urge that uh, the BBG look at um, using a model that was working increasingly well for VOA in the, in the latter part of the time I was there, which is the, what I call the affiliate model, where you go to the existing broadcasters and you say, look, I'm not trying, I'm not going to compete with you. I'd like to join you. What can I do can, to get on your air? How, you don't cover Washington very well. Let us help you do that. Um, you, you know, get, become part of the shows. Get your people on the air. Become part of the conversation. Become part of the editorial conference call in the morning, where you're, discuss where you're discussing with, with this station, you know what they're going to cover. Get into the bloodstream. Become part of the conversation, well, and take advantage of the fact that they have audiences already built up. Create partnerships. I mean, create everybody partners. else in, in journalism. That's is doing right. It, right. And, we, and, and VOA is doing that all over the world. 
I, I think NBN should give it a try too. Now, I, I, I've, I've talked with my colleagues there. There are, there are problems. It's not easy in the Arabic world to be the American broadcaster uh, and find partners. And you know, you say, well, this one's tainted, that one's tainted. Well, I wouldn't be too worried about taint. If you've got audience, <laughs> I want to be on your air and I want to talk to your public. You know, and if you'll let me do it, I'm going to. This would be more my attitude. David, as Sean knows and Janet Steele colleagues here, we, we have a visiting scholar who's been with us and uh, has done quite a bit of research looking at all the ISIS media and, yeah. and their <clears throat> techniques and technologies. And his research is shocking because it shows how they have adopted very sophisticated media techniques um, some of their videos look like video games, right? Um, and they've been very specifically targeted online at millennials, especially in certain parts of the world. Very deliberately, um, sort of a niche audience, if right. you will. They don't have a network, a TV network. They're doing this online. They're, this is this is real guerrilla, yeah. Information, if you can call it information. I don't think I would. Are we responding properly to that? I mean, I get the VOA and the structure there and all the rest, but this kind of sort of guerrilla operation, is that what we need more of, too, in our response? We need to point out what's wrong with their message. Uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I, I, I saw something today which is going to be unveiled at the Atlantic Council in a couple of weeks, and I don't want to unveil it here. Let me, oh, see go how, ahead. let me see how much I can tell you about it. <laughs> Let's just say that there's an effort being worked on that my, my little think tank is working on among, with others uh, to find the lies in the ISIS videos. And there's lots of them. And they're sure. kind of obvious. Mm -hmm. They say they're in a city. They're not in that city. You can prove it. They say that uh, uh, they did X or Y. You can prove they didn't. You know. So I, I, I think part of the, do you know the, uh, does any of you know the, uh, the, the website stopfake dot something? It's, it's a it's Ukrainian effort, I believe. Fantastic play, uh, uh, effort to show the lies in the Russian propaganda. They say they don't use cluster bombs. Guess what? There's pictures, their own pictures, that show their cluster bombs. Uh, the Russians say, this isn't a cluster bomb. Well, yes, it is. <laughs> you know, we can prove that. So, so there, there are lots of things like that that I would like to see VOA do more of and the other broadcasters do more of. And frankly, the government ought to be working every day to produce the lies of the day out of these people. Because they make them, they, 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 it's just a constant flow. Yeah, but uh, falsehoods, all and, the and fake, fake uh, uh, video t it, television it, it, that's it, been it, shot in the wrong place. It's, and all to the rest it's of it. totally true. But if the model applies that we see here, you know, trying to correct the facts, all these fact check things mm -hmm. actually by themselves don't move people. Well, people because respond. that's defensive. That's defensive, mm -hmm. which is why I what talked. What are you saying? We've got to be on offense for our own values and our own country and what it stands for, and and in a positive way. And I think that you know, we've. We've done that, but, but I think in past history, we've been more successful at it than we are at the moment, frankly. Um, and how you go about that, I mean, it, it, there's a public diplomacy side to that. It, it does partly just require money and people and time and effort at a level that, unfortunately, my colleagues at state um, who do wonderful work, and I was proud to be one of them, you know, don't have. Don't have. I'd like to see the level, uh, you know, the game upped greatly um, and become more aggressive. Um, and, you know, as I said, you know, you could take the, the Martian and translate it into about 30, 40 languages and, and m distribute it all over the world. And that's a, that's a fictional story, but it's a story about kind of the American spirit, which I think is the kind of movie that is the sort of image we would like people to see that is one aspect of America, you know. I want to go to the audience for questions. Just one last thing for you, though. David, you were at the VOA for four years. Right. What are you proudest of? I'm, I'm proudest, I think, of, of bringing the place back from a pretty low spot. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, the team there was um, felt battered and bruised. And, and I think they now, I've, I, I, I like to think, I hope, that with speeches, and um, blogs and communicating, as you and I do for a profession almost, um, I've helped clarify what the mission is and inspired, I would hope, another new young generation of journalists to join the Voice of America, to join other news organizations, and to do uh, the work that 
that you and I once did and are very proud of it. Well, thank you for your comments and thank you for your work at The Voice. It's really terrific, really terrific. Thank Why don't we open it up to your questions now, wherever you want to go with them. Uh, well, I think he's, David's used to them, so. Yeah, have one, back have there. One in the back. And, and tell us who you are and fire away. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, what can be done to raise some of the money for some of these efforts, uh, getting together people over the Internet and getting the local groups to come on into it and keep everything transparent? Are you talking about private money? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, uh, there are various ways of structuring this kind of work, and I guess it could be done in the private sector, too. Uh, and it is bidding in a way. I mean, there are... There are NGOs that uh, that stand that do journalism. Uh, Human Rights Watch, uh, you know, it is is a wonderful organization, and basically I know the leaders of it quite well. And they said to me, somewhat sadly, um, journalism, as we knew it 25 years ago, is you know, is, is it's a it's a shadow of its former self now. Many of the major newspapers have closed. Um, those that remain don't have the, the number of correspondents covering the issues that they used to. If you want to get human rights covered as a subject by major news organizations, you practically have to do it for them. Yes. So that's what Human Rights Watch does. <laughs> they, they basically run like journalists. They go out and get the stories. They get the video. They get the sound. They, get the, they take you there. If you go on their website, it's amazing. And I think that kind of effort can bear real fruit. It draws attention to... It shines a light in dark corners in a way that, uh, that private journalism used to do, but now maybe it's going to have to be a mixture, which includes nonprofit organizations with a point of view on a particular issue, like Human Rights Watch. Next question. Well, we've got one in the front, but we'll get this last one in, the, one in the back, and then we'll come back forward. Hi, I'm Justin Snyder. I'm a f former undergrad at GW. Uh, and this was really illuminating, particularly the discussion around your research at Cambridge, uh, the state-backed television versus VOA-type models. Uh, and I guess what I wanted to ask is, let's say we get the resources we need for public diplomacy. You get that we, not necessarily you, but someone becomes that White House advisor, that information czar, so to speak. Um, we do all that. What types of variables would we need to measure besides audience penetration in order to assess the influence and the success of these types of programs? What's the next step? It's a really good question. Measuring impact is one of the most difficult things uh, in public diplomacy and in, in broadcasting. Um, it's certainly not a science. Um, and, you know, it's very important to do it. And you look for different ways. And, you know, we tended to use just audience size but everybody knows that doesn't mean necessarily impact. So we, uh, at the BBG is now looking at ways to try to measure impact. And they ask different kinds of questions in the polling that they do, which is quite extensive, by the way. Um, you know, did, did you, did you, can, they look for examples where somebody heard something on the air and actually did something or told someone else about it or whatever. So you look for ways to measure impact. I guess over time, you kind of get a sense of whether you're having an impact or not if you're broadcasting to a particular country for a sustained period of time. Some of the, some of the uh, service chiefs you know, at VOA just have an almost granular sense. And they know when, it's, when, when they haven't been having impact for a while as opposed to when they did. And they change course because they can see it's not working what they're doing, you know, whether it's the platform or the type of journalism, the subject matter. Um, in the digital world, of course, it's increasingly easy to know how many people you reached and what they clicked on, right? So some of these things are getting easier. Um, you, it's possible to know what subjects people are really interested in uh, in a way that we never used to have before. So there is some progress we're making just because of the change in the technologies that's allowing us to have a better sense of impact and, you know, really what did people want and what did they... And you can also track what do they do with it in some ways digitally as well. But we're in the, inf the, the that whole area is in its infancy. And you're, you're, you're right to ask the question. It's a huge area. Uh, and, and the taxpayer is quite right to ask, or their representatives, you know, why should I give you money? What did you get me for it? It's a very good question. Your, your number, actually, um, uh, on your viewership in Iran, 
quarter of the population is yeah. a striking number. Yeah. What do you know about that audience? What do you, is it, what's the granularity of impact with an audience? Because that's a very large audience. Very large audience. Um, I used to say, uh, you know, uh, when I lived in, in communist Poland, that I lived in uh, the most pro-American country on earth. And, uh, and I did. It's true. Yeah. I, I, there's several people in the room who can, who can confirm that, including my wife, who is Polish. Uh, and, and she even, was so pro-American, she married one. That <laughs> was a mighty, mighty, mighty charitable effort. <laughs> uh, uh, but but um, uh, now I would tell you, from having watched the, the kinds of broadcasts and the kinds of audiences we have, that Iran is the most pro-American country on earth. What? It is. The public, not the not the government. All right. So, what's your impact the there? Who's your audience? Is it young? Is it's, it old? Do you know what the demographics are? The demographics are um, yes, we do. They're 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 good. In other words, they they're they're quite mixed. Um, they probably tend a little older, a little more male, but still pretty good demographics. Um, th this is a country that, when it wakes up and it drinks its coffee in the morning, wants to know what Washington is saying about it. I mean, they have an addiction to knowing. What is the great power saying about us, the great Satan, or whatever you want to call us? They want to know what we're, what we're saying about them. They are deeply fascinated by the United States. And so VOA feeds them information about the United States and its policies towards Iran. And yeah, here's the Bibi Netanyahu speech. You name it. We'll give it to you. We want a relationship with you as listeners and viewers. And you know, in, in recent history, there have been occasions when we've received video and still pictures from people on the ground in Iran and after cross-checking them to make sure that they really were filmed where they said they were and so forth, we've, we've run them. So you now have this kind of engaged thing where the audience helps you collect news and so forth. And we basically, uh, I mean, we're just a very important factor in Iran. There's no question about it. So is the BBC World Service, I should tell you, which has an almost yeah. similar, not quite as large as ours, but almost as large <laughs> as our audience. I saw a question up in the front here. Right. Hi, Stephen Salyer, Salzburg Global Seminar. And for many years, Public Radio International. I uh, okay. wanted just to uh, pick up on the word you used earlier, co-production, um, and talking about the Russian-directed uh, co-production. Um, and it's always seemed to me that we box our journalistic efforts up so tightly as between the overseas broadcasting and the work we do domestically that often we're putting a very large investment into good journalism um, domestically, which never sees um, much uh, exposure internationally. And I'm, I know when we tried to start an international news program in 1995-96, still on the air, called The World, I had to go to the BBC World Service to uh, strike a co-production agreement. Um, it's been durable for 20 years, and the show has, I think, had an impact. But when I tried to then approach um, U.S. overseas broadcasters to get it distributed internationally, we ran into all sorts of, of legal and other difficulties in, in trying to make that happen. So my question, forgive the long-windedness, is really twofold. One, what would it take to try to open up the field of co-production in a much richer way uh, so that we could more fully capitalize on all the great journalism that's, that's, that's already being done and funded in the United States, particularly in a resource-constrained environment. And number two, open up some of the distribution mechanisms so the diversity of opinion that we produce every single day in the United States could actually be shared more directly with people around the world. Well, it's a great question and one that I thought about a lot when I was director and tried to work on, but I had some of the same frustrations you did. Um, I'm still thinking that VOA should be taking advantage of the existence of a national public radio and, and of, of Public Radio International uh, in one way or another. Um, I, I had some conversations with, about music, at least, you know, if, if we couldn't do news. And, and I still think that, that there could be some rich um, uh, kind of working together. Um, the, the hesitation is more on the side of NPR and PRI than it is on the, on, on the away side, I can tell you that. Um, the other thing you have to remember is that uh, not everybody speaks English. I mean, VOA, t honestly, has, has English broadcasting, and it's important in Africa. It's less and less important in other countries. And what really is the secret sauce for VOA is the fact that it's in 45 languages. And, you know, when events uh, uh, became worrisome in Mali, 
we didn't think French was enough anymore. We put Bambara on the air, you know, and that, that reached a huge new audience in Mali. Um, so English has its, I, it's the, I know it's the global language, but it, it's a, it has surprising limitations in some ways in terms of reaching, in many cases, the key audiences that the United States would like to get to, you know, you've got to reach them in their mother tongue, um, or at least it's more effective. I, I'm, not, I'm not dissing English, I love English, and, and, um, and I'd love to see us doing more with it. But uh, in a limited budget uh, environment, um, I tended to put money into other languages other than English because um, it would achieve a pragmatic result in a particular place for the United States. In the back, or unless you saw somebody that you were going to first. Sir. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for uh, an insightful interview. So um, I am a PhD at, uh, I'm doing a PhD on U.S. public diplomacy at Cornell, and I am from Tunisia. Uh, so I keep an eye, if you want, uh, on uh, the way the U.S. tries to reach out to my people in Tunisia and the, and the Arab world in general, and the way we receive it. And my question is, um, does U.S. public diplomacy and U.S. foreign policy still treat the Arab world as one entity, or does it treat it as separate countries? Because the way, where I want to go with this question is, uh, since Tunisia is now a democracy in the Middle East, it's a new democracy, very proud of it, uh, we hope it will continue and we hope we, we, we reach some great uh, results, but th this is also an opportunity for the U.S. to shine in a new country in the Middle East to improve its image uh, because there's democracy, there's freedom of speech, there's a uh, multiplicity of, uh, of opinion. So the U.S. can actually talk to many people and let them decide whether they would like the U.S. or not. So is there a policy, for instance, for Tunisia to improve the U.S. image? Or do you still treat the Middle East as one entity? Because I don't see, sometimes there are differences between countries and the U.S. should like right. really consider that. I mean, thank you. Uh, you're in the Arabic space, and I don't, VOA didn't broadcast in the Arabic during yeah. the time I was director, so it's a little bit off of my area. I would say that I know my colleagues at Al Hura, at, at MBN, uh, d were developing programs for specific uh, countries. They did a lot of very specific broadcasting for Egypt, for example. Okay. I'm not sure whether they did something special for Tunisia. Do you, do you know, Dan? They were starting to work on it, and yeah. the public diplomacy area, and Jim Bullock, who has been there recently working through our embassy. Clear work focusing on yeah, the, more scholarships and things like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah. And the opening, and there's been great expansion of the Fulbright program and other activities. Okay. Dan, Dan Sreet. I'm kidding that people here will still talk about the Arab world. Yeah, yeah that's the yeah. thing. Dan, Dan Sreebni uh, of the State Department, a very distinguished uh, foreign service ex foreign service officer, uh, was the uh, uh, the conduit of, for our relationship with the State Department with the Under Secretary mm -hmm. for a number of years. We work closely together, and he knows everything. So that's why I asked. He knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> Question over. Oh, sorry. Oh. Right over here. Yeah. Thank you. I'm uh, Harvey Leifert. Uh, I'm a retired uh, USIA Foreign Service officer, and I did several stints at VOA uh, over those years. Uh, I really liked uh, that you hinted that it would be a good idea to reconstitute something like a, a modern USIA. But in my experience at VOA, they always chafed at the fact that they were part of USIA or under USIA. And I doubt that a new uh, USIA would be an effective uh, control or whatever you want to call it, bureaucratic head over the voice and the other radio stations. So I was wondering if you could expand a little on what you think well, a new public yeah. diplomacy effort could be bureaucratically. What would the organization be? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not again. I, first of all, I don't, I don't have the answers. You know, I, I, I can't draw you a flow chart. I, I, I don't think it would be useful, really. Um, I just do feel that the President of the United States needs to be advised on these issues by somebody who really knows what they're talking about and is in the White House. I feel that. Um, and I feel that uh, the budget of public diplomacy and of efforts at the State Department and other agencies needs to be better. And then finally, I feel that international broadcasting should have one boss who's empowered to, to get the, the radio freeze and the, and the VOA to collaborate 
uh, to make the budget that it does have, and hopefully we get a little more, um, as effective as it can possibly be. And I think collaborations and working together on various things, that's the best way to make the broadcasting work. As to whether we need a whole bureaucracy with a, you know, somebody at the head of it and all the rest of it, I don't know. Because I, I am conflicted, I have to admit, as former VOA director, I wouldn't particularly, I liked the fact that the, I, th I thought that the board, the fact that the board was there created a firewall between policymakers and journalists, which was appropriate, which was needed. I, uh, you know, at, while I was director, from time to time, policymakers would reach out, reach out to me and say, I'm not mentioning any names or giving you any specifics, you know, could you please tone down your coverage in country X? Because we're, they're, they're helping, the, that country is very helpful to us. And I would say, well, you have your job to do and I have mine. Um, it, are you telling me that the journalism's bad? Is the complaining government, or can you give me any information that allows me to say, I've got some work to do here because editorially we're off base? Because if so, I'm all over this. But if you're telling me that, the, that another part of the US government doesn't want us to be quite so tough on country acts on human rights or whatever because there's some other interest, I think that America can walk and chew gum. I think we can cover news honestly on the one side and on the other have as close a relationship as we need to at the State Department level or at the White House level on, on policy issues. And sure, there are going to be governments that will complain about it, but you can say, well, I, I'm sorry, we don't control VOA. They, they, they have this charter. Here, I can show you what it says. They have to do this. They're supposed to tell the truth about uh, things that are newsworthy uh, to an audience, and the audience in your country is worried about human rights. Sorry, can't help you. you know? So I, 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 um, I'm conflicted. I don't really know the answer. I, I just know that I feel the president needs better, higher level advice. This should be taken more seriously and funded better. The State Department's efforts should be better funded. Um, and uh, as a country, we just should be taking this more seriously. We used to be really good at it. We're still not bad at it. But we're allowing authoritarian states to spend billions, I mean, literally, three and four billion, five billion, you know, fantastic budgets, which although, I, I, you know, I wouldn't change places with them because I don't like their message much, and I don't think it's got long-term resonance. Yeah, money helps, you know, especially in uh, complex uh, in television and production or in, in the new digital media where, you know, the, the, more you, the more assets you've got, the more you can do. So I, I, I'm not suggesting the reformation of the USIA. I wouldn't oppose it necessarily. We just need to get more serious about this. It doesn't necessarily mean a whole new bureaucracy. It means a different attitude at the highest point, at the highest level. One last question on the side. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, Liam Goodwin, an undergraduate here at GW studying uh, political communication. So uh, earlier you addressed uh, the need for things like an, a bigger budget, like direct leadership with the White House, but you also addressed civilian controls and the need for those. I was wondering, to a certain extent, couldn't American values of freedom of speech kind of uh, hurt our ability to, for the best and the most effective public diplomacy? And couldn't things such as uh, things that are not necessarily hate speech in America be interpreted as hate speech in other countries? So like, how could we uh, mitigate things like that? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, That's why we like our undergraduates yeah. so much. <laughs> I think I'm... I'm almost stumped by that question. Uh, look, uh, the latter part of it, um, obviously uh, what's happening in our country and how we talk to each other and what happens here um, speaks loudly around the world. And we're having a complicated time in our country right now. <coughs> we're in an election year, which always makes it very interesting and very complicated. And a lot of things get said that probably aren't ideal from a public diplomacy point of view. Um, I'm sure a lot of public diplomacy officers are spending their time explaining what various candidates, well, I think what he meant to say, or, or well, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't, he's just a candidate. You know? <laughs> I can just imagine, he doesn't run anything. Um, uh, I, can, I can almost hear them saying, and I would have been. Um, so it's a complicated and difficult time, but at the same time, you know, this kind of messy democracy that we have, everybody sees it, warts and all, and, you know, I pr personally, 
<coughs> all of its fault drawbacks, I prefer it to many of the other systems of government I see around the world, and I think most of the people watching <coughs> do as well. Even now, admittedly, things are not good right now for us, but um, uh, you know the systems are kind of kind of being stretched at the seams. But uh, so that's the second half of your question. The first half was was sort of about money and and. Uh, the, the concept of the, you were referring to my talking about the Pentagon getting into this game and so forth. Um, there are people at the State Department are not comfortable with that idea. I'm not uncomfortable with it because I think, uh, look, first of all, it's a serious matter. We need the money and they have the money. Plus, they have an interest in doing it. Um, and I have a lot of friends in the, in, in the military who, who I would trust to, 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 to put a real effort into this that might make some difference. Might trial and error, you know, you learn. Um, I personally would prefer to see an effort to try to influence people overseas, um, overseen by civilians. And I think some of the efforts at the Pentagon have not been so successful because they haven't always been. Um, I, I, this is really public diplomacy work, and it belongs under the, under the control of the State Department, whoever's doing it. What, what is your name again? <coughs> Liam. I want to I want to follow Liam, and we'll wrap right after this. But I, it's a fascinating thing, and as I think about everything you've said here tonight, and I think about the presidential campaign that's underway, and the message that we are sending, wittingly or unwittingly, around the world, it can undo everything that you have talked about. It can sound intolerant. Yes. It can sound short. As much as you want to talk about to talk about the Arab, we're going to talk about all Muslims, yeah. right? How it's been can, some terrible damage? Done. How can you responsibly manage journalistically covering the campaign in the free speech way that you must, and contextualizing this to marry to the public trust, the global public trust that you have? So that someone who's listening to this half a world away does not take it literally, but that so you don't take a position editorially that says, pay no attention to that person because they're not serious. I mean, they, the fact is they're a candidate. The fact is three quarters of the people who voted in South Carolina the other night agreed with this idea of banning Muslims coming to America. I mean, that's a tough story to report if you care about the opinion of the world. Indeed. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's when things get the most difficult to, to explain and the most problematical from a sort of public diplomacy point of view that I even more strongly believe in honest journalism. Uh, that's when uh, a Voice of America or a BBC World Service, when the fact that they have credibility with the audience because they have been honest in the past is the most crucial when things like this are happening, when things like this are being said. But I mean, the job of a Voice American in an election campaign is to put the, con put the context there, to explain to foreigners who don't perhaps understand our wild and wicked system um, as well as we do, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how it's supposed to work. And OK, you know, it's messy. We admit that. Very public, very sometimes embarrassing. But in the end, we end up with the president. And um, more or less, you know, uh, it works. Uh, admittedly, we, we've never seen an election like this one. And some of the things that have been said uh, by some of the candidates are s extremely regrettable and very irresponsible in my view. Um, but they have the right to do that in a free country. They can say any darn thing. And they, and they are doing so. <laughs> um, it's, it's difficult, but it, it makes, I think the, the role of a VOA in a year like this is absolutely critical to put the context there for the, the searching foreign audience that, wants to, that says, he said what? What the heck? Where, what's going on here? And then tune into VOA and get this put into context, explained who is this person? What does it mean when he says this? Uh, uh, what doesn't it mean? You know, and what is U.S. policy on this matter? You know, as opposed to a candidate. You know, you, you have you, you can't say it enough times. That's right. Can't so say uh, it's very important work in a year like this, and and I'm proud of the people at the Voice of America who who do it. Um, 
and of other broadcasters and other journalists who do it, um, it's, it's more important than ever. But, but I, um, well, let's hope our country muddles through and finds itself a good president. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sean, anything else? Thank you all very much, and uh, thanks to the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication, and thanks to all of you, and especially thanks to David Enzer. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you.